We're back on our theme for the year 2022, which is the parables of Jesus. And today, we're going to look at three related parables that Jesus used to answer a troubling question brought to him by the disciples of John and the Pharisees from Matthew chapter 9. Now, Jesus does not explain these parables to us, so we're going to need to use the tools Jesus has taught us to help interpret these parables. Also today, we're going to just ask ourselves a question that has been troubling Bible scholars for centuries, and that is how many layers of meaning can be drawn from the parables of Jesus? Let's, uh, let's discover that today. So let's read Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 17. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, join us with your spirit and help us understand these parables. All this I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's begin with the first troubling question. Verse 14, the troubling question. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? This question is the context of our parable. The context is fasting. And fasting was a big part of the Jewish religion at the time of Christ. We learn here that the Pharisees thought fasting was important. The disciples of John thought fasting was important. Fasting was practiced frequently and often in the Jewish religion around the time of Christ. Now, you won't find any requirements for fasting in the Law of Moses. The closest you're going to come is that during the celebration of the Day of Atonement, God repeated several times that he requested them to humble their hearts in preparation for that ceremony, humble their souls. The strongest argument you're going to find for fasting is from the example of Moses himself, who did fast and long and hard at various uh, common moments in the time when they were going through the Exodus. Here's one example, for, for example, from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 15 through 21. Now, this is when God himself was about to destroy all the Israelites and Aaron for having created a golden calf while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. Here is that passage. So I turned and came down the mountain while the mountain was burning with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I saw that you had indeed sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way which the Lord had commanded you. I took hold of the two tablets and threw them from my hands and smashed them before your eyes. I fell down before the Lord as at the first forty days and nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin which you had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Moses also fasted while he was receiving the Ten Commandments up on the mountain, 40 days, again without food or water. When evil Haman's decree about the murder of the Jews across all the Babylonian Empire came to the attention of Mordecai and Esther, they called for a fast because Esther was going to need to enter the king's presence unsummoned, which could have resulted in her death, and also to call upon God to protect them when the decree was found to be unchangeable and they had to go through with the attacks upon the Jews, they were able to defend themselves. Ancient rabbis were encouraged, uh, encouraged everyone to, to pray and they were also venerated for their often and frequent prayers. The Ninevites fasted when they heard the message of Jonah and when they repented, they repented by fasting. Now the self-righteous Pharisee, you'll remember in the, in the Gospels, the self-righteous Pharisee boasted before God that he fasted twice a week. Isaiah gives us the best answer to this whole notion of fasting when God uses all of chapter 58 of the book of Isaiah to talk about their hypocritical fasting, which the people of Israel were doing at that time. Here's, for example, Isaiah 58, verses 3 and 4. Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? 
Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and strike with a wicked fist. This was the Israelites' hypocritical fast, and God had an answer for that type of fasting, and this is his answer from verses 6 and 7. Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the band of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount also condemned hypocritical fasting from Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The context of this parable is indeed fasting, but we learn in the parallel passage in the book of Luke that the Pharisees may have put the disciples of John up to this question in order to trap Jesus. That might be why the disciples of John asked the question the way they do. In this case, you'd expect Jesus perhaps to answer with a harsh rebuke since he would be answering the Pharisees. But instead, look at these uh, answers that Jesus gives. Look at these parables and you'll find that Jesus is instead answering with tender wisdom. He wants them to, be, to receive answers for their legitimate and sincere question. Now fasting was, as we learned, something that people did while there was mourning, where there was life and death situations, and this indeed is the case. John the Baptist was put into prison in Matthew chapter 4, shortly after Jesus himself came out of the wilderness after his 40 days as fasting of fasting also. So we also have just discovered that uh, if you read ahead or back a little ways in, Ma in the book of Matthew chapter 9, that Jesus had just finished uh, returning from a, a large banquet thrown by Matthew Levi, the tax collector. So this question of fasting and when it's appropriate was a good question. Now this question indeed is loaded. It's loaded because the religious expectations of the day was all good rabbis practice fasting. And because Jesus doesn't care for his cousin, John the Baptist, well, they really need to know why he was not fasting. So let's dive into Jesus' parables, these three related parables, to see what the answer is to their question. Let's go on to verse 15, an appropriate time. An appropriate time. And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Weddings are a time of celebration. If somebody wants to fast during a wedding celebration, this would actually be an offense to the wedding party, an offense to the groom and the bride. However, in the days that follow after the celebration, then celebrants that would attend the wedding can also go back to fasting at that time. It would be appropriate for them to fast after the celebration, but not appropriate to fast during the celebration. So this parable is about an appropriate time. When is the appropriate time to fast? Since John is in prison, it's perfectly appropriate for the disciples of John to be fasting. Jesus acknowledges that, and he, app he approves of what their, their lives are going through, what their souls are hurting about. He affirms that they have a need in their hearts to fast. But Jesus is also showing us something else. Something else. Can there be a deeper layer, layer of meaning to this parable? Well, I think there is. Clearly, Jesus is the bridegroom in this parable. He is the bridegroom, a very important person. And while Jesus is present, there is a time, and appropriate, it is appropriate to be celebrating when he's in their presence. And notice in the example Jesus gives us, the bridegroom doesn't, doesn't just leave, he is taken away. And from hindsight, we understand that Jesus indeed was forcibly taken away to be tortured, to be crucified, and die on the cross. Does Jesus not care about his cousin, John the Baptist? Well, of course he cares about John the Baptist. But when there are two issues at play here, they're both life and death matters. When there's two issues at, matter, at play, then it's, of course, the eternal matters that Jesus cares about most. There are things worse than dying. An eternal death 
when you take, do not take advantage of the fact that Jesus, the bridegroom, is there and the good news that he has come to bring this world is right before their eyes, they must pay attention more closely to the eternal matters rather than the mortal matters. So, Jesus is this good news that they're celebrating. Well, let's turn next to the next example Jesus gives in the second il illustration. This is verse 16, an appropriate material, an appropriate material. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. So once more, on the surface, this looks like just a picture the, of, of knowledge, basic knowledge that everybody understands. How many tailors have made the mistake and learned the hard way that if they put the wrong material in their patch, the material is going to actually be worse off after that shrinking happens to the new material. So they, he tried to fix a two-inch two uh, rip in the material and it ends up being rent by a four-inch tear instead. The, labor, the, the laboring was attempting to make a repair, but the repair did not work. So how does this illustration relate to fasting? How does this illustration relate to fasting? Well, not all uh, scholars agree what the proper interpretation of this is. Uh, we see here that this is probably an analogy, so we need to figure out what variables do we plug in? There's some spiritual variables to plug in here and discover what the meaning of this parable is. So let's find out what this is. I, I prefer to think of this as a parable about the proper and improper material. We all have broken hearts. We all have souls that need fixing. And what is the proper material to fix that? Should we then use rituals and traditions of religion like fasting in order to help repair our souls? Is that something that's going to fix us? Well, the answer is no, of course. That's an improper material. We need a compatible material, a material that is compatible with our souls. And the, the Jesus Christ, our Savior, was man and God together. He is the proper material to repair men's souls. We need someone born out of a human nature and a divine nature in order to bring us a proper repair. Only Jesus can offer our souls the type of fix that we need. Forgiveness, mercy, kindness, redemption, and inner regeneration. Only Jesus Christ can offer that. You know, the early church had problems with people trying to apply old ancient rituals to modern Christianity, and it did not work. Remember, there were some uh, people that tried to make Jewish or non-Jewish converts to Christianity uh, become circumcised, have been them circumcised. And the church met and had a council about that, and they said, no, they do not need to be circumcised. They've already repented. They've already come to Christ. They've already been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. They do not need to be circumcised. That's not necessary. The same way with fasting. We do not need fasting as part of our repair process. It's not part of our repair process process. Only Jesus Christ can offer us a proper repair. Simple repentance and turning to God for his salvation is enough. So we do not need to use an incompatible material. We must use a compatible material. There are a lot of things going on in this world today which we mourn for and there might be times when we think fasting would be appropriate and that's okay. That is just okay. But do not consider mourning as a method for a repair process in your soul. Mourning and fasting are something else entirely different. In the Old Testament, mourning also could not save anybody. Fasting could not save anybody. But it was something that was humbling to their souls and would bring them closer to God. God does ask us to humble ourselves, to draw near to God, and He will draw near to us. Okay, we're ready to wrap up this uh, discussion of these parables with the last parable that Jesus offers us from verse 17. An appropriate vessel. An appropriate vessel. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. Again, on the face of it, this indeed is a piece of basic knowledge helping us understand practical matters and how not to waste a valuable material like wine uh, when, the, when you're producing wine. Wine is a long and arduous investment. You have to build and cultivate a wine grove, a wine arbor. You have to do some pruning of the vines. You have to do lots of cultivating. 
Uh, you have to, after waiting months in the sun, you have to pick those grapes at just the right time when they're at their peak of the harvest. And then you have to turn those grapes by pressing them and filtering them into the most precious and pure grape juice you can find. And if you're not wise and you put that uh, new wine, that fresh grape juice, into old wineskins, your entire investment will be lost. The wineskins are going to burst. You'll never be able to use them for anything over again. And the wine will be spilled and drained and your, your new wine is going to be lost. That is a horrible thing. Now, is there a deeper meaning to this passage? Is this also an analogy that relates to fasting? Is this something where we can draw upon some more an, a plug-in of spiritual matters and find a deeper meaning for this? Well, hopefully John's disciples are now so curious that they'll want to actually turn and follow Jesus and see the wisdom of his message and so that they will find the answer to their question, the real answer to their question. Now, Jesus did not come into this world to put a lifeless liquid into dead, inflexible containers. Jesus was about to open the floodgates. He's gonna, he was going to open the tap of an infinite barrel of abundant life, spirit, and truth. Any attempt to place this kind of dynamic power into some old leather is going to burst the bottle, and God's investment of thousands of years of preparation for our salvation would be lost. Now, if you see Christianity as just another set of rules and regulations that uh, you should not have fun, uh, you've got to go to church on Sundays, you need to volunteer for mission trips, you need to attend all those meetings, uh, if you need to tithe your income, and oh boy, you need to pray all until you're bored in the face, pray and pray and pray, well, then there's a good chance that your vessel is not prepared. It's not a new vessel prepared for the type of abundant life God is going to bring us through his spirit. We need an appropriate vessel for God's gift. If serving Jesus is just another list of do's and don'ts to you, then perhaps your vessel is too hard to receive his life-giving spirit. If you can't sit through an hour of worship and wait patiently through a sermon that has been designed to edify your souls, then perhaps you are an old wineskin and not a fresh new wineskin. This is a matter of life and death, and there's more at stake here than you may realize. We must turn to God. We must repent. We must ask Him to soften our hearts and make us ready to receive His Spirit before it's too late. We all have hardened hearts. We're all cracked pots. We're all broken vessels, and we need Jesus Christ to come and fix all of that in our souls. We have fallen short of the grace of God. We have missed the mark, and we have all sinned, and the sentence of death is upon us. That sentence of death is our deserved wages. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you, you don't understand at all. You must be born again. You must uh, be born of water in the Spirit. There must be a radical transformation in your life or else you cannot even see the kingdom of God. We need that sort of radical transformation in our lives and we need it before it's too late. We must be able to have this kind of a broken heart that's fixed by the appropriate patch of Jesus Christ. Then we can celebrate with our bridegroom for his good news of salvation, Jesus Christ, and we will have hearts that will receive the new wine of God's Holy Spirit, and it will be something that preserves us both. Heavenly Father, thank you for helping us understand these parables. Thank you for leading us in a proper interpretation. I pray, Father, that everybody would realize their need for our bridegroom Savior, for their patch in their heart, and the new wine that would fill in their new heart if they were asked for it. All this, Father, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.